Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be here. It's nice to be here in community, you know, together as a group of people um, at a time in, in the world. Um, it's important that we're here together in community. Um, you know, I had some feelings about like coming out tonight, honestly, because it's, it's just such a tough thing to be thinking about and the reality of what's happening around the world. And I'm very happy that it's a, a I came out to talk about a book that helps people, that's a guide that's helpful, because this is a time for us to be helpful with each other. And th what popped in my mind this morning was when, when you were governor and you had plenty of awful things happen, and the fires which you chronicle in your book, you know, that 3 a.m conversation that people talk about with politicians. Um, I just wanted to talk to you about the weight of that as a human being when you became governor of, of the state of California and, and how, how did you face that, that reality of being the governor with these very hard things that were gonna come your way, which they did. Well, uh... It's a very interesting question that you start this interview with. <laughs> um, but first of all, let me just say that I'm very, very happy to be here today. Um, you know, it's one thing to do those speeches and to go around the world to do speeches and the Q and A's and all those kind of things to promote the book. That's what you do. But I mean, there's another thing when you go to a place like this that is uh, the Culver City High School. And um, then you look into it and you find out that they have this extraordinary kind of career tech education programs here. Mm -hmm. I was so impressed when I read about it because this is one of the model schools where they teach kids a profession mm -hmm. and not just groom them to go to college not knowing what they're gonna do with their college degree. Because so many kids go to college just to go to college because it sounds good and their parents have the money to, to, to send them to New York or to in Miami or to Texas or wherever, to some school or to go to USC or whatever. But I mean, they don't have really a goal. And uh, here, they are prepping kids to have a goal. And the kids that are working here in career tech education, they want to get in the movie business. Mm -hmm. So the kids are here, here learning how to, to uh, preparation for a stage setting, how to build stages, and how to uh, do the electrical work and the camera work, and to set everything up and to really learn for the future so they can jump in and start working in the movie business and start making some really serious money. So to me, that is really great to kind of set kids in a certain direction. So I just want to applaud. Let's applaud the school for this great program that they have. Now, I, I will tell you, <laughs> because what Arnold just did, <laughs> he writes about, which is you can do any interview and let the person ask the question and then 
you tell them what you want them. <laughs> like, that was, and I, I understand you weren't trying to evade my question because it was, no. I'm not, and by I'm the way, good. I, I'm, but I'm also not trying to, I'm not like trying to get you here. I, I literally was thinking about the profound impact and import of your job when you became governor. But, the, but you wrote in this so exacting what you literally just did, which is bridging. Bridging. Exactly. It's awesome. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Thank you. But anyway, to answer. But no, 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 you don't have to answer no, my but question. I you, answer. you just bridged over it, and it's fine. But I, 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 I want to answer it because I just want to make sure that you understand that I didn't want to avoid the question. But the bottom line is that when you wake up at uh, 12 o'clock at midnight, and they wake you up and they say, you know, we have um, 570 fires mm -hmm. in California. Mm -hmm. This was in October, I remember. And, uh, and now, you, of course, you go back to bed and uh, you can't sleep. Of course. Because now you start thinking about it. How do we do that? 570 fires at one time in California. But then you wake up at 5 in the morning, like I always do, and uh, I call and I find out that there's 2,000 and 13 fires all over the state of California. Yeah. So think about that. I, I mean, it was like, it was every place was burning and, and we had to kind of move resources around very quickly, airplanes to dump fire retardant materials and the fire departments and coordinate them all. Uh, we had to evacuate 20,000 people down there. Actually, in San Diego, over 100,000 people that then stayed overnight at the Qualcomm Stadium. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had to organize that. So we had to fly down there to make sure that the people have the food and the water and the, the, the babies have the diapers and the dogs can go there and all this stuff. So there was a lot of things. I talk about that in the book, of course, uh, because there are a lot of emergencies and there's a lot of nights like that. Did you get calls like that? And, uh, you know, you have to really be on top of it. How did I handle it? You know, and I think that on day one, when I won the governorship, I basically shifted gears. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, you know, I'm not anymore now, you know, Arnold that is just thinking about myself. Now I have to think about the 40 million people in this state and I have to serve everybody. And so that was the kind of thing, I think shifting gears and making myself understand that this is now my new responsibility, I think really helped me. And of course you have a lot of help and I talk about that also in the book, that the, the importance is that we never should look at ourselves as a self-made man, mm -hmm. because everything that I've done as governor or in bodybuilding or in acting and all this was always with a lot, a lot of help. And uh, so I think with, with a lot of really experienced people and with their help, we were able to put those fires out and to make people safe again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you were talking about, just now, about a college and a kids learning about the movie business and trying to get into the movie business and programs like here that afford those kids that opportunity. And, you know, I don't know if everybody in this audience went to college. Um, I barely crawled out of high school. Um, I got 840 combined on my SATs. So I, I was not supposed to be a scholar. Um, and it's always sort of been an issue for me. And then I read a book. It's a novel uh, by a woman named Marisha Pessel. It's called Special Topics in Calamity Physics. It's a terrific mystery novel. But in the middle, she says, you know, life is supposed to be about where you went to school, what your family's income was, what your first job was, blah, blah, blah. And she says it isn't. And she says, and I quote, life hinges on a couple seconds you never see coming. And what you do in those seconds determines everything from then on, and you won't know what you're gonna do until you're there. And my question for you, Governor, friend, Arnold Schatzi. See what is, I'm saying? What do, you what do you think the biggest 
life-hinging moment was for you that you didn't see coming? Well, I think that it was uh, probably running for governor. Wow. And, um, you know, there was kind of always the, the debate about, you know, should I run or shouldn't I run? And um, my wife didn't want me to run. Mm -hmm. My kids didn't want me to run. Um, and so, you know, I kind of settled in into that, that I'm not going to run. And then um, Che Leno called me one day and said, hey, do you want to come on the show next week? And, um, you know, kind of talk about what your decision is. Are you going to run for governor in this recall election or you're not going to run? Whatever the decision is, just come on the show and, and talk about it. And um, uh, that morning, um, Maria slipped a piece of paper under the door of the bathroom. And it said two paragraphs on it. One of them said, in case you're not running, say this. And in case you decide to run, say this. <laughs> so I said to myself, wow, she expects one or the other. So she's not like 100% against that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a lot of other things have, of course, transpired in the meantime that uh, Dick Reardon kind of told me that he doesn't want to run, that I should run, he doesn't have the fire in the belly and all of those kind of, those kind of things. And uh, so anyway, I took this note and I said to myself, okay, that means that I have to make up my mind now. And on the Tonight Show, when I was sitting there mm -hmm. and the Jay Leno asked me that question, I then made the decision. Right then. Right then and there. Wow. And I said, I'm going to run <laughs> for, for governor of the state of California. So this is how that happens. It was one of those decisions. And may I remind you that what that means is that you have no team. Yeah. I had no team ready to go. <laughs> I had no, you know, a kind of communications director, kind of campaign manager, this. Uh, I had absolutely nothing. And I remember that the next, uh, that night, when I came home after the Tonight Show, Governor Wilson, who was the governor uh, Pete. for, yeah, Pete Wilson, right? And uh, he was a good friend of mine. So he came over to the house and he started talking to me about, uh, you know, what, what is our plan now? What is the next step that we should do? How important is fundraising and all that stuff? And so we started working on it and putting a team together slowly and surely, and uh, you know, the rest of it is history. Because uh, it was also one of those things where people say this is the worst idea. Uh, because he said, first of all, Arnold says, you're stupid <laughs> for <laughs> taking $20 million that you're getting paid for a movie and turning your back on that. You're making two movies a year, that's $40 million. And for seven years, you're going to go do that now? and not take that money? Are you, are you kidding me? Are you out of your mind? So there was those kind of dialogues. Others said, you are not really capable of running the state of California, and why didn't you start with something small like you know, mayor or a state senator or something like that? Of course, I have no, no interest in this little Mickey Mouse kind of professions, right? I know. So, uh, uh, so I said, no, no, no. You know what, uh, let me call Karen Bass. Hold on. Just have her come over and you can yeah, tell yeah, you her can her, her job is Mickey Mouse. Yeah. 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 So anyway, but the, the rest <laughs> is history, you know. I, uh, I climbed up in the poll numbers and then there was a, a very, very important debate uh, with all the candidates, the important candidates that were in the top five or six. And I won that debate and uh, I won the governorship. So the rest is history. But you also did something. But you also did something because in Doris Kearns Goodwin book, The Team of Rivals, you also created a team of people who weren't just diehard Republicans. And I thought that that was a really impressive decision. What, who, what, was that your idea from the beginning, that you would sort of bring in a coalition of voices? Well, 
the campaign was run, I would say, by pretty much hardcore Republicans. They were all, most of them were uh, Wilson people, except there was Barney Rees, right. who ran my after school programs, and then my foundation, and there was Terry Tamanen, who is the environmental expert. Um, and so those were two Democrats that, that, that were helpful in the campaign, but most of the other ones were Republicans, really Pete Wilson kind of guys. But then when I went into office. That's what I meant. Yes, so now I know that's what you meant. Really? Uh, yes. Was uh, I clear in what I was asking? You were, you were very clear. I mean, there was no you know, you can bridge. No, no. Uh, you can build a bridge no, over me back and forth I don't need all day. A bridge, yeah. But I mean, I just, you know, okay, so when I went into the office, um, I, of course, felt very strongly about what I always felt that it is uh, not helpful to the state if you have just Democrats or just Republicans working in an office like that in the governor's office because the brain power is amongst the Republicans and the Democrats. And I felt kind of if I have like Democrats and Republicans working for me, that that would be the best way to go. And that's exactly what I did. Right. I had certain positions filled by Democrats, certain positions filled by Republicans. And uh, it was something for Sacramento to get used to. I remember that in 2006, when I picked uh, Susan Kennedy yeah. as my chief of staff, I mean, the Republicans literally sat down uh, across the street because you can't talk politics in the Capitol. So you have to go across the street to the hotel. Or you can talk about policy in the capital, but not about politics and about elections and all those kind of things. So you go across the street. Isn't that where the word lobbying came from? If I'm, I, I told you, 840 combined SAT scores. I believe that the term lobbying came from that exact point. You're not allowed to talk politics. Somebody's nodding. Young man in the front, am I on point? That's correct. Fuck yes. <laughs> Oh, so relieved. Do you know anything more about the lobby thing? I'm, I'm not getting into politics. No, 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 no. But it was, the idea was that you would go across the street to the Willard Hotel. That's right. And in the lobby, you would run. Okay. That's right, yeah. So anyway, so that was good bridging. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But so, anyway, so we go across the street and the Republicans will sit the head of the Republican Party and the, the Republican leaders would sit down with me and say, you can't do that. You can't have Susan Kennedy as your chief of staff. I said, why not? I said, to me, I think she's the smartest, the most experienced. She worked for the previous administration, for the uh, Davis administration. I said, and she writes the best memos for me and she, the phone calls that I have with her and the discussions makes me feel like she should be my chief of staff. And uh, they said, but she's a Democrat. So I said, so what? If she represents me the right way, I said, that's all I care about. It's about how well she works and how smart she is. Yeah, but she's a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> so you, I said, I don't ask you what you into sexually. I said, uh, <laughs> I don't go around asking people what they're into. I said, what do I care if someone's a lesbian or if they're gay or anything like this? I said, that's perfectly fine. It says, but she's a bra-burning lesbian. She burned her bra publicly, and she's a Democrat, and, she, and they were just going absolutely nuts. We cannot work with you this way. And I said, well, I said, as far as I know, the governor picks his chief of staff. I said, then you guys don't pick anything in my team. I said, you just run the politics. I said, so you keep running your politics. I pick my chief of staff, and Susan Kennedy is going to be my chief of staff. And that was it. You know? so, but I had other Democrats there. And you know, the thing is that I felt that I should run the state because I had the only way you win in California is if you have, as a Republican, is if you have Democrats also voting for you and independents, because otherwise you can't win, because the majority of voters are Democrats and not Republicans. So I felt like I should represent them also. So I tried to do my best job as I could to represent them and to have Democrats there. So when, for instance, when we picked judges, uh, which is one of the jobs as a governor that you do, and when certain positions are vacant, then you pick the judges. And of course, Republicans traditionally always pick 
Republican judges. And Democrats always pick Democrats. And uh, so I decided to just tell them not to give me the party affiliation, mm -hmm. but only the qualification mm -hmm. of the person and the recommendations. And so we ended up um, you know, making more women judges than any other governor in history, and also more minorities than anyone. So I mean, so I was very proud with what we have selected and the kind of judges that we picked that I felt would really truly represent the state of California rather than representing just the, the, the California Republican Party, because I always wanted to be a public servant, but not a party servant. Ooh. Yeah, thank you. I have not heard that before. Yeah. I love that, not a well, party you, servant. Sammy. Can I use it? Of course you can, you can use anything that I say. Okay, good. Um, I, just, I just, before we, is that a bridge? we go on. No, this is not a bridge. Okay. But it, because when you do those kind of Q&As, I don't want to just sit here and answer your questions because there's a lot of things that I want to also say that maybe you don't ask. <laughs> Like, for instance, I am so delighted that you have agreed to do this interview here with me today. Nice one. No, but I mean, you have no idea, guys and uh, women in here, it, you, have and no others. Idea, you have no idea of, of, of what a great friend Jamie Lee has been over the years. We met, you know, many, many years and decades ago in Sun Valley. You know, we up there skiing and uh, partying and going out for breakfast and hanging out, the families hanging out together and having all this kind of stuff. And uh, then eventually we did this movie in the True Lies, yes. right? <laughs> and we had so much fun and the movie was a huge success largely because of Jamie Lee. Oh, and no, no it's, it's, absolutely, it's absolutely true. Thank it's absolutely, you. No, no, it's absolutely true. Okay. You were absolutely fantastic. And she's such an incredible actress. I mean, and I'm so proud that she uh, won the Oscar. I mean, it's like, it's, okay. so think about that. Thank you. She won the Oscars. I mean, this is, like, this is like huge. And there's a connection here, which you also should know. Her father, Tony Curtis. Okay, yeah. Okay, I directed him in a, a TV show called Christmas in Connecticut. Right. Christmas in Connecticut. You, he was the star in that show with Chris Christopherson and some and other Diane people. Cannon. Diane Cannon, exactly. Mrs. Hare, uh, right? Yeah, that, that was took four hours to do her hair every morning, <laughs> which we had to kind of calculate in. But in any case, just wanted to, 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 to show to you, I mean, the, the, the connections that we have. And I collected her father's art. Mm -hmm. He was a fantastic painter. That was one of his hobbies, his painting. And so I had several pieces of his, and he was like stunned when he came over to my house and he saw the paintings there. So anyway, so this is the kind of history that we have. So that's why I'm so happy and so delighted that we have Jamie Lee Curtis here with us yes, tonight. Yes, I agree. Okay. Thank you, that's fine. Thank you. I feel I'm being rude to you all, because I feel like my back was very much to you. Yeah, I Arnold's thought was back very... is not so much to them. No, no, my because... back was to you, and I apologize. No, no, but I turned my chair right away in the beginning, which Oh, you I did... see. You're, a much, better, you're yeah. much better at this. Yes. Okay. Here's my, here's my mean, question. I... No, no, and I am... So sorry about that. Okay, I'm, this... I'm, I'm actually asking something that I have not known. And we've known each other, as we said, a long time. We were social friends. We have this nice family connection with Tony. So when Jim wrote True Lies, Jim called me at home one day. I was sitting in my bedroom, phone rang, ring, pick it up, hello. Hi, Jamie, it's James Cameron. <laughs> Hi, James. And he said, you know, I've written this part for you and Arnold in this movie. I'd like you to read it. I read it. And then he and I met. And then there was like a big gap between that meeting and me ultimately showing up that first rehearsal day at Jim's place where I actually came in character because I wanted to 
kind of get the whole feeling of Helen. And I was talking to Jim about it whenever I last saw him, and I said, it must have been weird for Arnold, because this is a great movie, a great part, and Jim is saying, by the way, the woman I want you to play opposite, both as a lover and a fighter, is Jamie. And I'm sure it must have been strange for you because I'm Tony's daughter, your friend's daughter. You directed Tony in the movie that you directed. It must have been crazy making for you, like, Jim, really? Her? There's no one else in show business <laughs> that can play this part that I can act opposite? I know Jamie, we are social friends. You know, I'm this. You know what I mean? I'm just a little wacky, and I'm sure there must have been a moment. Was there had to have been? It would have been like kissing your sister, like kissing your friend's daughter. Must have been strange. Was that in the? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? I mean, it must have. There must have been a moment. Well, to be honest with you, I said to him right off the top. I said, "That ugly son of a bitch." <laughs> No, nice. but I mean, look, I was delighted when he told me that. I said, that's funny. I said, I know her actually very well. This is amazing. I didn't even think about that. I said, that's a really great idea. She's funny. You just came out with a movie, A Fish, a a fish yes, Called the Wanda. The Fish Called Wanda had come Exactly, out. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, yeah. And so I said, oh, yeah, she was fantastic in that movie. And she can play the sexy part, and she can play the housewife, and she can play all of this kind of thing. And the tough lady, too, because she's physically strong, and she's physical, and she, I think she can do it. And so that's exactly what the reaction was. And so that's why, um, well, you can tell the other story, then uh, what happened when we did the movie, and it came to the credits and all that kind of stuff. I will yeah. tell that story. So I'm going to tell that story, and then I'm going to tell another, or ask another question, which you'll bridge off of, and it'll be fun. <laughs> um, I will tell you this. Uh, you know, um, I'm sober tw almost 25 years, and one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but you know, one of the sort of tenets of uh, my life is that you suit up and show up. It's just an old-fashioned idea. Um, when you're asked to do something, you suit up and you show up. And Arnold and I have asked each other at times, for instance, um, I was, uh, they gave me the great honor of putting my feet in the cement in front of the Chinese theater, and uh, Arnold came and spoke for me at that event. So we have shown up for each other. And I shared at that ceremony. So True Lies is made, obviously, Arnold Schwarzenegger in True Lies, you know, starring Jamie Lee Curtis. And they, we made the movie, we had a great time. Honestly, it was the time of my life was making that movie with Arnold and Jim. It was fantastic. I got to hang under a helicopter three days before my 35th birthday over the Florida Keys. I mean, it was incredible, um, obviously working with Arnold. And the movie then we wrapped in April. The movie came out July 14th or whatever of that year. And the phone rang my house again, picked up again. Hi, Jamie, it's James Cameron. <clears throat> um, <laughs> said, hi. He said, listen, um, I wanted to tell you something. I've watched the movie. It's great. Um, it's really a domestic epic, and it's really very much about a marriage. And I want you to know that contractually, Arnold Schwarzenegger has it in his contract that his name is above the title, and that's it. That's the only person whose name is that way. He said, but I've gone to Arnold, and I asked him kindly if he would be okay with your name also being above the title, because it feels appropriate for this movie, True Lies. And Arnold Schwarzenegger, my friend sitting here, my bridge friend right here, <laughs> said, of course. 
And that, to me, ladies, gentlemen, and others, is the greatest testament about who this man is, is that he understood that it was the completely right thing to do in that instance, and it showed me what kind of a man he was. And uh, he did not have to do that. Now, it was, it was awesome. So you brought up, like, the sexy parts. Like, I was, like, there was parts in the movie where I had to be sexy, and yes, I will tell you that when, we, when I got the call that we were for sure making the movie, I called the only person, I, call, I called two people. I called the production manager. First person I called, the production manager, and I said, hi, it's Jamie. Um, listen, when is the hotel room on the schedule? <laughs> and he said, in two weeks. I did not eat for two weeks. And then the second thing I asked was uh, 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 a thing about lighting. But the sexy bits. You and I are both known for our bodies. Now, I, I, I've, as you know, you mentioned uh, everything everywhere all at once. And that is all me. There is no special effect in that part. Um, which was a little shocking, I think, for some people. Now, you've recently, you're very much on a tour. You're doing a lot of talking, which is good. Um, but you talked about your body. And I think it's interesting that you and I are both really known, you, obviously, way, way, way more so, but we are both known for our bodies, for our figures, for the way our bodies look pre predominantly naked. And Bodies change, and you've been talking about it a little bit. I just thought we could talk a little bit about that, about that reality that you have been recently talking about that I very clearly showed completely in, in that movie, and yet I think everybody sitting here deals with it. There's not one of you right now that isn't putting your hand to your stomach. You're sitting down. It's just not good. <laughs> it's just, it's real. And I'm just curious about how you're handling it and, uh, or not. That's <laughs> <laughs> very funny. But yeah, first, well, stick with me. First of all, yeah. I stick with you. I know. Uh, first of all, let me just say that that scene that we did. Yeah. It was so spectacular. I mean, it's, I always tell people that, you know, a lot of times acting is kind of like being a plumber or something like that. You go to work at five in the morning or at six in the morning and you grind it out all day long until, you know, late at night and then you come back again in the morning and do the makeup and this. It's, it's, it's not as kind of spicy and fun as sometimes people think it is. But there are moments, you know, when it's great. You know, when you do great stunts and you jump all over the place and you shoot and you do hang off helicopters and stuff like that, you know, then it becomes fun. But also, there was this scene where I'm sitting here in a hotel room <laughs> and she comes in all dressed up and now I'm seeing literally all day long a striptease. I mean, think about that. I mean, how much did it cost you on drinks when you go to a strip bar? And I don't just, know, I've never been to one. I, me neither. I don't go to strip bars. But how I mean, do you uh, know that you spend money on drinks? Well, because I, I, I listen to conversations. Oh. Much, uh, <laughs> but I mean, uh, <laughs> but so I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there and I'm having <laughs> you come into the door and then all of a sudden, it's the taking off your, your dress. And there you're standing there with this tiny little kind of bikini outfit in the underwear and with the bra. And then, <laughs> then you, and you're not only just standing there, but now you're doing this striptease, kind of this dance. <laughs> and it was like, and, and you really, I mean, one of the things I, I can tell you is, this woman has talent. <laughs> Because it was like, it was absolutely wild. I mean, like a total professional. I don't even know where, if you, if you took classes in that or if you, someone, 
someone was uh, teaching you something like this. And the reason why I'm saying this is because we were, as you know from the movie, uh, those that saw the movie, we were doing the dance, the tango. Yeah. And so I know when I was practicing with her the tango, you know how far advanced she was compared to me. I had to kind of practice over and over and over again, and she got it within a few times dancing the tango. So that's why I know she's really talented with those kind of things. So then I said to myself, this is amazing when I watched you with this dance, from morning to night doing this striptease and doing this dance and all of this kind of stuff, then you had to fall over and you kind of trip over well, yourself but, but and all so of those kind of things. But so in that moment, honestly, what actually happened was, it was, it was scripted, you know, that she comes in and it's her husband, but she doesn't know that, and it's his wife and he doesn't know that she's gonna do what she does. And you know, we did it, and obviously there's no rehearsal and there's no choreographer, and you just sort of do it. And I got to pick the music. Um, and, you know, we did, I did what I did for a couple hours, easily, three or four hours. And then it got very quiet. And sets are quiet, but, you know, it got really quiet. And I was kind of a little freaked out. And, you know, we would do it, and then I'd go back and get redressed, and then we would do it again. And I remember Jim coming up and whispering in my ear. He literally walked up to me and he said, will you let go of the bedpost? And I said, sure. He said, I'll have a mat on the ground for you. I said, okay. And they, the stunt team came in, put a mat on the ground. I think we only did it twice. I'm telling you, as long as I live, I'm 65 years old. Right now, we're almost in about a week or a month, or whatever. The biggest laugh. I will ever get in my life was when we were at the premiere in Westwood, Tony Curtis was there, he was sitting with me, and when Helen Tasker lets go of that bedpost, I have never heard a laugh like that, I've certainly never sort of delivered a laugh like that, and I think the reason why is because Jim had never seen me dance, like he, there was no audition, there was no, and I can dance a little. And I think it got a little too intense. <laughs> I think they were not expecting it to be as intense as it was, and I think it got a little intense. And I think it also got a little weird that I'm doing this for my husband when I don't know it's my husband. And that's why Jim was like, I think I know what this needs. This needs that moment of relief that it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be funny. Anyway, I think it's a huge laugh, it's a giant laugh. And well, I, I can tell you that the, we laughed on the set. Yeah, it was, That's when he knew that this was actually a funny really idea. Really good it was idea. A great idea. But it was exactly. his idea, yeah. I give him yeah, full so, credit so, so, for it. But anyway, I just wanted to say that you were fantastic Thank dancer. Thank you, darling. And really great, and now let's go to the body. The, the body, yeah, thank I, you. I, I, you know, thank you for I coming always, back to it. I make, I make it very clear that um, I don't know how other people feel about their bodies when they get to a certain age, um, but you know, only from what I hear in a gym when I work out, you know. So I have a Dougie right here in front, is from, the, from Gold's Gym. Dougie, get up here. He's one of my training partners. Get up, Dougie, come on now. Hi, Dougie. Dougie look at this, there's Dougie right there. I didn't say you should flex. I just said get up. But anyway, uh, yeah, he's un unruly, this guy. But in any case, so I, I don't know how other people feel, but I mean, I, I look in the mirror and I say to myself, I look like shit. But, okay, and, but uh, I'm, and, uh, I... So I, I, I just, you know, this is just, I, and I, I feel like, you know, it's kind of, you have to kind of, like, take it for what that is, that comment, because yes, I feel I look better than you know, the majority of people at, the, at 76 and all that stuff, I said, but still, when you have been hailed and when you have seen your muscles and, you know, and, and, and the striations and the veins coming out of the deltoids and the separation and the pectoral muscles and the abs and the calves and, 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 and all of this stuff, it's, it's kind of like now you're looking at it and you say, where, did that, where the hell did it go? <laughs> It's, it's just wild, you know, it's like really amazing when they say, you know, that uh, it's, it's a very punishing kind of experience. And I think the better shape you were in at one point, and the more you were celebrated to be this perfect kind of a 
male body, in my case, in your case, uh, female body. In a uh, movie called Perfect. And you, and on top I mean, it was of it. insane. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And I see pictures of me from then. Yeah. Or that video with me and John Travolta that is a bit of a meme. It's insane. I know. But that's what I'm saying. So now, so what do you see when you look in the mirror? You're standing there naked. What do you see? I have a phrase that I like to use. It oh. says, when you're looking in the mirror, you're looking at the problem. You're also looking at the... <laughs> a major <so> problem. <laughs> <laughs> but you're also looking at the solution. You talk about breaking mirrors. You talk mm -hmm. about it. I think the mirror is a very important thing. Yeah. You know, the, Elvis Costello, the deep, dark, truthful mirror. The mirror does not lie. You no. know, numbers don't lie. The mirror does not lie. No. People lie. But the mirror does not lie and numbers don't lie. Um, you know, it's a process of self-love. I mean, we have, I mean, you are a beautiful man. I'm not an unattractive woman, even clothed. You're a beautiful and, woman. You're a beautiful woman. Thank you. But, okay, so what I, say but what my point, is. but this is an interesting thing to have two people who were known for their bodies where their bodies have changed. And I am learning to accept it. I've been much more comfortable about the fact that I'm now a size 12. Like, I don't care anymore. I just buy size 12. It looks fine. It's all fine. It's all good. But, and by the way, I don't overeat. I exercise regularly. I am not proselytizing that you should just forget everything and just, you know. But I also think it's an interesting moment for you because you have so much going on. This is incredible. And I think I look at you, and I think you look terrific. Well, thank you very much. But I mean, I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. But I, I, it still does not take away the fact that when I look in the mirror, I see shit. <laughs> and, uh, you know what? And, 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 uh, and I, I also have to tell you, this is another important thing that is uh, to, to be mentioned. Even the day when I won the Mr. Olympia competition, for the sixth time, I won it seven times altogether. I know. But I remember the sixth time I was in South Africa, I won the Mr. Olympia competition. And then I went home afterwards and I looked in the mirror and I said to myself, I mean, I have so much further to go. It's just, I, I'm, I'm still this skinny, I'm still this is the wrong and this is wrong and this. And I was very critical and I asked myself, how did this body ever win this competition? And so this is, I, I think, what it is is that I'm very critical of myself. And this is, I think, the very thing that motivated me always mm -hmm. to be better. Mm -hmm. Because it was never kind of good winning one Mr. Universe, then right away you say to yourself, no, I cannot really sit in this laurels and celebrate. I have to go for the second one, for the third one, for the fourth, for the fifth, and Mr. Olympia, and Mr. World, and Mr. International, blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. It's kind of like the, I talk about this guy, Hillary, that is mm -hmm. the first and, one to climb yes. Mount Everest. And then he's up and down the top, and he looks over, and he sees another peak, and he says, oh, I have to figure out how to go and conquer that peak. And so it just keeps going and keep going and keep going. And I, I think it makes life exciting, but you are much more critical about yourself, yes. But also your point about Hillary was that, can you imagine if he was dropped on top of that mountain by a helicopter? Yeah would he have any of the sense of accomplishment? And you really talk about the hard work of your life and how hard work is beautiful, chopping wood, carrying water. You talk about your childhood and that you would have to earn breakfast. Just for those who haven't read it yet, like, I was a tough mom. Like, I only allowed you a certain amount of tea. Like, when you hear, <laughs> how tough this was. Can you just walk us through a little of what you describe earning breakfast looked well, like we, in your family life? Yeah, well, it was very unusual. I would say for the day standards, uh, for those standards then, I think that all the kids kind of <coughs> went through the same type of thing. Uh, but my father would just, you know, he, would, he he's a, was a military guy, he was a police officer, and uh, he would uh, have us do 200, in the uh, push-ups, and he would have us do 200 knee bends, and he had us do certain chores 
uh, Joyce, to, to before we were allowed to have breakfast. Yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, he was the one that actually gave me the idea of be useful mm -hmm. um, because, uh, you know, he, that's what he always said. And uh, you know, just be useful. Even when I was working out, my dad would just criticize it and he would say, this is just for yourself. You're looking in the mirror and you're pumping up and you're doing all this stuff for yourself. He says, why don't you go and get your muscles chopping, chopping some wood for the neighbor? The lady is 80 years old. She needs someone to help her with the wood. So chop some wood and just uh, shovel some coals for her and he will get muscles this way. So it was always about kind of performing and doing things like that. And, you know, it really helped me to kind of my entire life to not really shy away from working because as kids we already had to work hard mm -hmm. and we had to shovel coal and we had to chop wood and we had to kind of do, you know, carrying the water. We had no, uh, uh, you know, running water in the house. So we had to get it from a well around 200 yards away from the house and we had to carry the buckets of water home in the snow, in the, in the in winter, in the summer, in the rain, it didn't matter what. So this is the kind, that's the way we grew up and I think it really helps you. Uh, when you then grow up and get older, I always hear this voice, be useful, be useful. Even when I sleep in in the morning, I hear this voice, be useful, and I get up, I jump up at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. uh, or whatever, and get up early and, and start getting going. But it, going. It's, it's inspiring, because of course, it has driven you for your entire life in every aspect of your of your public life as a bodybuilder, as an actor, as a politician, as a right, right. public speaker. I but, mean, it's... But I'm talking about it in the book, not to talk so much about myself, but what I have learned from that. Yeah. And I've, I've, I've really learned that if we struggle and if we work hard and if we work out hard and you do sports and everything, that it makes you just better in everything. That you feel good about yourself. And I think this is a very important lesson because so many young kids today think there's a shortcut, but there is no shortcut. It's all about work your ass off. That's what it is. When I came to this country, I remember that I was going to school hours, several hours a day. I was working on construction sites uh, because in bodybuilding there was no money then. I was uh, taking, you know, uh, going to college and. Um, you go, going acting, doing acting classes and, and all of that. So it was all of the stuff that I did in these 24 hours. And I always tell people when they say, I don't have enough time to work out, I don't have en enough time to learn or to read a book or to do this or that or to educate myself. I tell them you're being, making a big mistake because the, tw the day is 24 hours. So if you sleep six hours, I say you still have 18 hours left. And you work 10 hours, let's say, uh, maybe eight hours now with, uh, you know, some people are really sensitive about not working too much, you know, so. <laughs> um, uh, but I mean, so, so now you have all these hours left. And then, and of course, there's some people out there that say, oh, I need more sleep than six hours. Well, just sleep faster. And it's all I can, uh, <laughs> just all I can recommend. But I mean, so I just, I just believe in grinding it out and working and working and working. And there's no backing off of that because this is what produces kind of performance and makes you feel great. I mean, Ted Turner used to say, you know, early to bed, early to rise, work like hell and advertise. And that's exactly, that's exactly what I believe very strongly in. Work like hell and advertise, sell, sell, sell. Well, you also just couldn't have a better little talk partner here because like, I am like all about the cell, as you know. You have two very ambitious people up here. I, the two of us are hustlers. And I say hustlers not to swindle, but we f hustle. You know, we love it. I love my life. I love my job. Nobody loves showing up on a set more than me, except maybe Arnold. The two of us. It's funny that Jim somehow knew to put us together because although we knew each other socially, you did not know that about me. And as you've gotten to know me over the years, I am a hustler. I hustle. I love it. Sell, sell, sell. You write in the book about how uh, in the movie business, you know, people... You, a lot of people are like, well, I don't do interviews, and I don't do this. I'm always like, bullshit. You know, you'll do it when it's the New Yorker, but, not, you, know, but you won't do good. I'll tell you, and this is 
tr absolute truth, and this is a, not a slam on him at all, I love him. Daniel Craig, who was, who was James Bond, and of course just did all those movies, and you can only imagine how difficult that must have been for him. We were doing Knives Out, and they said to us that Good Morning America was coming to do an early thing on the movie, and they were gonna pair people. And he said, well, I'm not gonna do Good Morning America. I was like, of course you're gonna do Good Morning America, Daniel. You're gonna do it with me, we're gonna have a great time. And you know what, by the end of that, he and I were paired for every interview, we had the best time, because it's part of this. And I am like you, I have a lot of judgment about people that don't sell, because we like to sell. Yeah, well, I mean, to me, to be honest with you, I'm very happy when they don't sell, because then I'm out there selling, and they go and see my movies and not their movies, you know. I so, understand. So I, I, I never complain. I never complain. You know, Love it. Is, uh, no, but I mean, you are, you're absolutely right because I feel always very strongly, and I talk about that. No matter what it is, you got to communicate to people what you want to do in what direction you want to go. It doesn't matter if you are an artist. You have to sell your art. You have to let the world know. And I hung out with Andy Warhol in New York and with Jamie Wyeth and with uh, Leroy Neiman and all of those guys I hung out, they all were into kind of like, how do we figure out a way of penetrating through the market and selling our art? And look at what the genius Andy Warhol was, you know, putting his wig on and his glasses, even though he didn't need glasses, he didn't need the wig and stuff like that, and running around with his little Polaroid camera and with his tape recorder, and he became a character in New York. And people wrote about that and then about his art. Yeah. And so now, I mean, you know, stuff that in the 70s were like $50,000 painting, now is worth, you know, $60 million. And this is all about the way he sold his art, the way he sold himself. And it's with everything. If you're an artist, if you're an actor, it doesn't matter what it is, you have to go and let the people know you can have the best product in the world. But if the people don't know that it exists, you have nothing, absolutely nothing. So this is why I always was a believer in that. And as I explained in the book, I was a salesperson. And I was uh, you know, in a career tech education. That's why I mentioned career tech education earlier, because I was uh, a student of career tech education. And I learned how to sell. For three years, I went to school how to sell. And I learned the art of selling. And that's where I learned how important it is to be able to communicate and to articulate the product that you're trying to sell or your philosophy you're liking to sell. I mean, imagine when you run for governor. How do you make the people really vote for you? If you articulate and if you explain to them what you want to do with California, with the state of California, and in which direction will you take that state, that's how you sell your philosophy. That's how you have them vote for you. So this is it's, it's, it's something that you have to do. And those people that don't believe in it, great, don't believe in it, don't do it. I would do it for, for all my products. That's what I'm doing also with the book. You know, that's why you will see me on every interview show. I'm out there letting the people know this book is coming out being useful. This is the only book that you should buy right now. <laughs> <This is> it. <laughs> yeah. And before we go to audience questions, which we are about to do, I just want to read you this one section from this very exact point that he just articulated as my final comment here. And this is him in writing this book. <clears throat> it's about selling. It might sound scary right now, but you can do it. I promise you. I've been around a long time. I've met a lot of happy, successful people from all over the world. Famous people, powerful people, interesting, creative people, normal, good, hardworking people. What they all have in common is that they never let anyone else write their stories. They know how to sell their vision better than anyone, and they walk peacefully through the world, confident in that knowledge. I love that. Thank you. I love that. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. All right, what? All right, time for some questions. Thanks to everyone who sent them in. First one, any advice to the Republican members of Congress to be useful? I would say, in general, what I said earlier, if our politicians would pay less attention to pleasing their party 
and more attention to pleasing the public, the people, the voters, they will be much better off. Because then they work together, because Democrats and Republicans have to work together. That is the bottom line, rather than just worrying about one thing, and that is, I have to get reelected, just worrying about their job. They should just worry about one thing, and this is, how do we make this country better? And the only way we make it better is if Democrats and Republicans work together. So this is my advice to both parties. You know, there is no action way to right, and there's no action way to the left. The action is in the center, because that's where the people are, because it's inexcusable that we have 90% of the people in, in America say that we should have universal background check on weapons and not pass that law. I mean, it's stupid. Arnold, one doesn't have to be a member of Congress to be Speaker of the House. Would you be open to be drafted? And if you're an amenable, how would you herd the Republican members of Congress? I would, uh, I would never do that job. <laughs> because I'm scared that if I'm surrounded by insane people that maybe I will become insane myself. <laughs> What have been the role of mentors in your life? Well, you know, I was very fortunate that I've had really interesting mentors and, uh, and idols. Uh, if it is uh, Reg Park, who was on the big screen as Hercules when I was 15 years old, and he inspired me to become a bodybuilder and to get in the gym and to work out five hours a day. And... Uh, when I came to America, Muhammad Ali was another mentor and also idol um, that I felt was so strongly about his great personality and his extraordinary generosity um, that I wanted to emulate him and to also give back to the country the way he has done. I loved, I fell in love with Nelson Mandela, who was another mentor and kind of idol of mine, uh, that he is the one that I mean, showed us about forgiveness. You know, someone that has been imprisoned uh, for so many years, for 27 years, and then becomes president of South Africa, and not to pay back the whites, and to just say, let's bring whites and blacks together because it's better for the country. That, to me, is the ultimate of greatness, uh, to have this kind of a mentality. And uh, Gorbachev was another one that inspired me a lot. Um, because he is a man that uh, grew up on the communism, and uh, then, as he became more and more powerful, and then eventually became president, he realized that communism didn't work, and he dismantled it. I mean, think about what that takes—the guts that that takes—to go and dismantle your system that you grew up under. I mean, it's staggering to have this kind of guts and to do that. So to me, that is like to recognize when something doesn't work and to go in the other direction. To me, it's just amazing. So President Gorbachev, he dismantled communism. And of course, it didn't end up very well right now with what, what is there. But I mean, the idea was to create a democracy. I think eventually they maybe create a democracy. But, he was a great, great leader that recognized the mistakes and did something about it. This person addresses you as governor. Governor, when friends are tempted to leave California, what do you say to them to inspire them to stay? The governor of California? No, no, no. no. If People are saying they want to leave California. Well, you know, look, people shop around where they want to live. Uh, just like we do with shopping. I mean, so if, if, if the, the state of Texas can offer them better things than the state of California, they will go to Texas. So it's the same as if we're going to Florida or to New Mexico, to Arizona or wherever. So people will move. I think that we have to be very careful in California to cater to the people more and not to go and make it too expensive to live here. Uh, it is just, I think politicians have done a terrible job uh, in general in California because they have adopted this whole thing in the 80s and 90s about the no growth uh, because of environmental reasons, but it doesn't work. 
no growth doesn't work because the people will come anyway. So now we have gone from 20 million, when I came to this country, we had like 18 million people, and now we have 40 million people. So this whole idea of not building apartments and not building homes and then really making it tough to build an apartment building, all of this has backfired big time now because now we need a million more homes in, in, in Los Angeles alone because that's why we have all these homeless people. So, I mean, the politicians did that. People didn't do that to themselves. Politicians have done what we see right now on the streets, is homeless people and not being able to afford a home because it costs in Santa Monica $3,000 for one bedroom apartment. And that is outrageous. It's only because we don't have enough supply and there's a tremendous amount of demand. So they should have built according to the demand and then the cost of that would have been half of it and those people wouldn't be homeless. So this is really the problem. All of the stuff that you see, by the way, all the problems that we have is created by politicians. I mean, think about it. I mean, I love, yeah, it's true. I love when the politicians go and say, oh, we're just cutting down now, finally, the, the high interest rates. Well, hello, who created the high interest rate? <laughs> the politicians. I mean, if you keep spending money that you don't have, that's what Washington is doing. We have a $35 trillion debt. Every year we have $2 trillion deficit. It's insane, and they keep printing more money. So when you print more money, the value of the money goes down and everything becomes more expensive. So they create the mess. They create the mess, and then they go and they try to fix it. But what Einstein said, remember, the same mind that has created the problem cannot solve it. So now they're trying to solve it. And they're showing off on television and says, oh, we just reduced the interest rate by a half a percent. A oh, big deal when it went up from 3% to 8%. Yeah, this is really great. I mean, it's like, it's totally machugane, the whole thing. It's just outrageous. Yeah. Next question, um, you probably just answered it. What advice do you have for Governor Gavin Newsom? <laughs> the only advice I have is to just think about, you know, everyone not just about your constituents, but to, to think about everybody. And uh, that's what I was trying to do. And I'm not saying he's not doing it. And I, you know, remember one thing we never do is, as a, a previous governor, we never criticize a sitting governor. So this is just an absolute no-no. Because I know, having been there, how difficult it is, the challenge, to try to please everybody. It's, almost, it's, it's literally impossible. So there will always be, you know, if you're more to the left, then the, the right will criticize you. If you're more to the right, then the left will criticize you. It's a very, it's a, it's a tremendous difficult balancing act. So I just want to wish him great luck because if Governor Newsom does well, then the state of California does well. Mm. That's the bottom line. Terminator versus Michael Myers, who wins? You know it. <laughs> Would you comment about the switch to a largely plant-based diet and how, how, how the decision you made to do that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, our mutual friend Jim Cameron yes. uh, talked me into um, eating less meat and the doctors, you know, having had three heart surgeries, the doctors obviously have talked about that, to eat less animal products, less meat, that's better for your health. And so I would say that I cut down probably around 70% of my meat intake, um, but I wouldn't call myself a vegan uh, or a vegetarian. Uh, because I stu still have every so often my steak. And when I go to, uh, to uh, Austria or to Germany, I still have my Wiener Schnitzel. <laughs> and uh, so I still eat uh, those kind of things, and my chicken every so often. So, uh, but I would say 70% I, I cut down my, my meat intake. And I have to also say on top of that, that uh, Jim Cameron comes from, when he talked to me about that, he comes from a health point of view personal, physical health, 
but also health of the earth. I was going to say the environmental. Yeah, exactly, yeah. because this, uh, to produce livestock, creates approximately 28% of the pollution. Yeah. And so we have to think about that. So if everyone, he, of course, Jim is extreme. He doesn't eat any animal products, period. And he's uh, 68 years old and he's in fantastic shape. So it works. But you know, not everyone can do that. So I just think that people, they should just maybe, you know, reduce a little bit the meat intake. It's healthier to reduce it. And uh, it's better for the world and for the pollution because one of the things that I'm very passionate about is, is uh, uh, the environment. And the reason is because we have to reduce our pollution by a lot. Because seven million people die every year because of pollution. So we have to recognize that. So this is the number one killer. Is there any one movie you regret passing on? I've passed on some movies <laughs> that I regretted, yes. But um, the circumstances were such that I was busy doing other movies. So there was nothing else that I could do. I already had contracts for another movie. Um, so therefore, I could not really do the movie. But there were two or three movies that I would have loved doing, but there was just not enough time to do it. Did your personal vision or ambitions change after becoming a father? Uh, yeah, I think that you become more conscious about uh, kids and about education, about kids' issues and stuff like that. But even before, no, actually, it was, I think, after my children were born, I started with the after-school programs, which is a program that we have nationwide that gives children after three o'clock a place to go where they get education and homework assistance and tutoring and stuff like that. And uh, we have them be reaching out to around 130,000 kids nationwide. It's been a very successful program. And as a matter of fact, we just had a, a fundraiser at my house. How much did you where raise, We had a poker Arnold? tournament, and we raised $7 million. You came to our poker tournament. Are you running for Dianne Feinstein's seat? Do I have to? <laughs> I, mean, I have no interest in running for anything. I have such a wonderful life. I feel pretty much like Jamie does about her life. I feel absolutely blessed mm. that I have this life. I would not exchange it with anyone's life, period, no matter who it is. I mean, if they imagine that I have had the most unbelievable life, you know, to be going from sport, from bodybuilding, traveling around the world and competing, then getting into show business and uh, to become, you know, a major movie star and leading man and making all of this money, and then become governor of the great state of California. And it just, the list goes on and on and on. I mean, it's like really amazing. And I have to tell you, and one of the things that I mentioned in the book, and that is, I was able to do that with the help of a lot of people. Because as I said earlier, there's no such thing as a self-made man. And I have gotten so much help from so many people. I mean, if you just think about what most people don't understand, when you're on a movie set, I mean, who does the makeup? Who does the hair? Who gets you the wardrobe? Who helps you with the stunts? Who films you? It's the camera guy. Who directs you? Who produces the film? Who finances the film? I mean, it's like there's 300 people on the set that help you to make you shine on that screen. So you have to say thank you to these people. Everyone has a tremendous value that works on that set. It's like unbelievable. And so this is the people, if in bodybuilding, the people that work out with me, like Dougie does with me every morning, and you know, people that are left and right of me, and they pump me up and they, 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 they count out the, the, the reps and the sets and all of that stuff. Joe Weider that brought me over from uh, Austria to America, mm -hmm. for instance, you know, uh, it's just unbelievable. Or uh, if you think about people like Jim Cameron, as a director, John Milius, uh, John McTurnan, 
Ivan Reitman that got me to do the first comedy. And the list goes on and on. People like Jamie Lee, who was the co-star of mine that made the movie shine. So this, the, no matter which direction that you look, I got help. And people, when they say, you're self-made man, I said, no. I mean, I, I, I had 5.8 million people vote for me as governor. How can I call myself a self-made man? I didn't make myself governor. This was the 5.8 million people that made me governor. So this is an important thing that I mentioned in the book because when you recognize that people helped you, then you also recognize that now it's your job to help other people. Tear down that mirror and look beyond. Arnold Schwarzenegger. No, I, I just, I want to say one more thing. The only reason why else I was able to do all of those things that I just mentioned is because of America. Without America, this would not have happened. This is the greatest country in the world. Greatest country in the world, remember that. <laughs>